Welcome, everyone, for those that are listening in um, to this recording. My name is Eze Valdez. I do content and programming for The Alchemist Kitchen. And uh, we have George Lewis to take us through the astrology and archetypes. But before we do that, I'd like to remind everyone to check our uh, events calendar for future uh, if workshops as well as series. Uh, for the first quarter, we're actually going to have uh, Merlin Sheldrake do a book club with us. And in February, we're going to have Dr. Vandana Shiva uh, to be interviewed by our CEO, Lou Sagar. Um, and and so we'll, we'll start out with getting to know George. So George, um, how did you get into you know, astrology? Like, what is your background? How did you start out and what's your training? Oh, you're on mute. Can you oh. It keeps on turning. Can you hear me now? Is that good? Yes, yes, uh, there you go. Um, well, thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be able to contribute to the Alchemist Kitchen. It really is. A, a great, I'm, I'm very, very delighted to be here. Um, spirituality has always been a major part of my life. Uh, from a very young age, I've been always curious by the stars. I've always been curious by things beyond the material dimension. I mean, as a 14-year-old boy, I, I devoured the Nostradamus prophecies. I originally read them in French and then I read them in translation into English and, and, and they fascinated me. Um, and then I was able to deduce certain things from them and interpret them in a certain way and see what, what, what works and what didn't. And about seven, eight years ago, actually it was seven years ago when Uranus moved into my ninth, my ninth house, um, a man came into my life very, very suddenly. He came to my art studio through a guru friend of mine and literally suddenly started to teach me astrology. I was a skeptic. When, when he came into my art studio, I was painting in New York City seven years ago at a big studio in Chelsea, Manhattan. And when he came into my studio, um, he was a fascinating man. He was in his seventies, a man called Monty Taylor. And um, he, he started to teach me astrology. And I was pretty skeptical to begin with. I came from quite an intellectual British tradition and I, I, I felt it was uh, a little superstitious. But as he started to teach me, I realized that it was me who was being superstitious rather than the astrology. I realized it was an inversion. I realized that actually there's a deep science and it's an ancient science to it. And it's tied to astronomy because at the end of the day, the difference between astronomy and astrology is astronomy tells you what is. Astrology tells you how you feel and how you relate to it. And both are important because one is left hemisphere of the brain. The other is right hemisphere. And to be complete as a human, you do both. So for me, it became very, very interesting approaching it from a skeptical perspective to realize that really there's a lot of validity in this ancient language. Wow. So can you expand on that a little bit from the left and the right hemisphere? Like how can planets affect our, our life, you know? So in what sense like, is it like energetic? Like how can it be... Is, well, is to, it predictive or is it like I, just... I, I tend not to, to get too much into it being predictive because I think we have free will. But what I do think, they carry an energy. And that's what tonight's lecture is going to be about, the archetypes. So, for example, Mars carries an energy. So when Mars passes over your sun or over an, a, 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 an aspect of your chart, it's going to trigger a certain energy, which is martial, which is willpower, desire, drive, anger, depending on how you operate it. So you have the free will to take Mars at a high vibration, which is the sacred warrior, or at a low vibration, which is anger and fear. Do you see what I mean? So that it's all about the intersection between free will and destiny. I think we all do have soul contracts. When I look at, I mean, I've looked at two, three, five thousand natal charts now professionally in my life. I see soul contracts, but then the question is, is how does the individual choose to express that in his or her life? And that's where the free will comes in. Wow, oh, amazing. So I haven't heard astrology explained like that. So 
Um, so that you started seven years ago. And then where has astrology uh, taken you? And you said that you were painting before. So how did they intersperse with each other? Um, so can you tell, tell I mean, us I, a little bit more? I've been a painter and a musician all my life. I've been a professional artist uh, really since I, I, I left university pretty much. Um, and um, I work with sound frequency professionally as well. So for example, this is one of my latest bowls. It's actually a Saturn bowl, it's F. And the reason why I brought it for tonight is because it's the winter solstice. And that's ruled by Saturnia. Originally, the winter solstice was the festival of Saturnia. So this is a Saturn bowl, it's about grounding. Um, so I work with frequency and light, uh, frequency and sound. Um, but astrology is just a, a wonderful way, another universal language for us to tune into who we are. Um, I always share this with friends, that uh, the Vatican Church, the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church, systematically banned, abolished astrology, banned it from uh, really around, around the ninth century common era, right through to the mo uh, modern period. And you never ban something that has no power. You only mm. ban something. You only ban something when it is a threat to your authority. That's no one can disagree with that. That's just a statement of truth. So then you begin to realize real astrology, when it's used properly, is a powerful tool. And so for me, it's all about self-sovereignty, using these tools of archetypes in order to better know yourself. Because when you better know yourself, you can better ha have better relationships. You can have a better work. You can have a better relationship with your mother or father, your lover, your son, your daughter. And, and, and it's all about self-knowledge. So it's just another way of self-improvement and for us to get away from the illusion and into reality. So before you start the, the lecture, can we do like a sound meditation first? And then, and then you could begin. I would, the I would love session. that. I, I think what I'd like to do is in a way, call in our intention, because whoever's going to be listening to this, I would hope they're going to be some keen astrologers, but they're also going to be some keen skeptics. And what I and I was I was definitely a keen skeptic, meaning I was a real skeptic when I came to astrology. And one thing I like to try and do is set the intention for us to entertain the eternal child in ourselves. What does that mean? It means can we come to the drawing board today open? Can we come here to receive? Maybe especially if we're very successful living in a big city where we move very fast, can we slow down? Can we tap into our yin? It's nothing to do with whether you're in a man or a woman's body. It's the yin energy of reception, of femininity, of, of receiving, of intuition. And I think if we can take some of these sounds in, which I'll play now, that will hopefully open up portals for us to receive the medicine of the language of the heavens, which is astrology. going to play my Saturn bowl, which is in the Tibetan scale, it's F. So it's the base chakra, it's the root chakra, and it helps us ground us during the winter solstice, which of course the winter solstice is the first degree now of Capricorn. Um, I happen to love the winter solstice because as a solar person, I'm very solar, it's the, the days are now starting to get longer. And yet the irony is it's the first day of winter. So we're going to celebrate this, these winter holidays with calling it in with the F, which is the Saturn sound.
I don't know how well Zoom picks up, but I mean, this goes for like five or 10 minutes. So I'm going to put it down so we can start the lecture. But um, sound therapy is very powerful because it really does go through the entire body. The sounds actually vibrate the whole body and they, they can sort of reconstitute areas of the body where we have blocks. Um, this is kind of ancient medicine. And uh, it's, it's something which I love to share with, with audiences and patients, clients alike. So why don't I start now? Is that a good, good time to start, Ezra? Yes, yeah. Okay. So astrology, I often talk about it as sort of the, win the missing link. We're kind of re-engaging, re we're relearning the language of the heavens. So what is our connection to the cosmos and how can we re-establish this vital link? Because this link was known by the ancients and it's only in modern times that we're re-establishing re this link. And the magic of astrology is to unlock who we are. So in this introductory lecture, we're gonna learn the basic concepts of astrology through the planetary archetypes. Now, if anyone ever says that they don't believe in astrology, you can be sure that they have never studied it because they most certainly are being superstitious. Even a superficial study of uh, astrology will, will really will demonstrate the truth of it and that it is an ancient science. Now, I believe, I think many of us believe, certainly I think the alchemist kitchen is here as, as case in point, that we're at a threshold of a new paradigm. And these are remarkable times. Yes, they are challenging. And they're challenging because we're entering out of an old paradigm and into a new. One of my friends once said, we're nursing an ancient paradigm and birthing a new. So through the lens of archetypal astrology, we can find a path towards the light and through learning the meanings of the planets and the zodiac signs and how they interact it will give us greater insight into our own natal chart as well as what's happening globally. So the natal chart is the map, it's really a map of potential. And once you get to know your own birth story, you become more aware of it through the language of myth and archetypes. You can really step into your own power and learn much more about yourself and align better with what I call your soul contract. And to me, this is the epitome of self-sovereignty because astrology is after all a language. It's a language of the soul as much as of the stars. And it's a language of symbols. It allows you to make connections and see relationships that are invisible in other systems of thought. So I want to share this universal language with you tonight, today. And it's, a, it's powerful because it is in service of freedom. And we can only truly love when we are free. Now, on the subject of freedom, let's talk about free will. So we do get to choose whether we follow the light or stay in the dark. And if you think of Plato's allegory of the cave, it's a case in point. Do we remain in our narrow conceit about accepting the projection on the screen? Or do we courageously dislodge our chains and climb out of the cave and into the light? So the whole, the whole point is we have free will. How we interpret uh, the chart and or how we live out the soul contract is up to us we can choose to experience an archetypal uh, behavioral way as a high, in a high octave, like at a high vibration or at a lower one. So I believe we come to this planet to share, to love, to co-create, to learn, to cry with others, to be joyful with others. And so it's through our choices and how we respond to events that governs whether we articulate this high or low frequency. So this is our free will. So the language of archetypes that reveals itself through the planets is a beautiful place to start when we embrace, um, well, we, we, when we sort of start our learning and um, we start to um, uh, discover this powerful language. I think I probably should give you a definition of an archetype as I'm using this word a lot. So I think the original definition primary definition is like it's an original pattern or it's a model from which copies are made much like a prototype but the way I use it and the way most astrologers use it is according to Carl Jung the psychologist it's a pervasive idea it's um, an image or a symbol that forms part of the collective unconscious so archetypes are living energies and they contain ideas they're also specific patterns of instinctual behavior and thought the forces that make up the collective unconscious, the impersonal part of humanity's psyche that all of us share. 
So these archetypes automatically project themselves outwardly from within us onto whatever screens are available. So your positive reaction embracing of something may be different to uh, someone else's person. Someone else might have an objection to it. So uh, you may have a preponderance to one thing and the other person may feel that is objectionable. People have different uh, tastes and archetypes. And, and once you start to understand how the archetypes are lined up in someone's contract, soul contract, their natal chart, you can be a lot more... Um, not only forgiving, but a lot more uh, wise in understanding the journey that that person has. It's certainly taught me as an Aries a lot more compassion about how other people live their lives. Um, you know, these archetypes are the life energies that pour out of us through the day and the night, whether it's conscious or unconscious, and they do mold and change our behavior. So the modern world, certainly the world that we have lived in for the last two, three hundred years, if not a lot longer, to be honest, has been set up on division. That means separation of subject and object. And it's been built on that Cartesian philosophy of I think, therefore I am. And Descartes symbolizes the existential disorientation of the modern era. So everything that affirms my sense of being is because I think, not because I feel or have a body. So we end up distrusting all forms of intelligence. You see, our imaginative, bodily or creative relational intelligences really sort of go out of the window. Therefore, the philosophy of the modern era is just thinking. So all knowledge, according to this materialist philosophy, has to be built, uh, built on through data, mathematics, statistics. And in isolation, it's very destructive. There's no, according to this philosophy, there's no intelligence outside the subject thinking mind. This is very important to understand. You see, this contrasts with that feminine approach, which is a primal worldview, the one that is um, ensouled. The human being is a microcosm of the, of the macrocosm, as above, so below. You know, the world speaks a symbolic language. There's synchronicity uh, in what we do. You start to listen to signs. Um, we're, we begin to realize that we're in a conversation with the world. And there's always this ability uh, to communicate between the inner and the outer. The magic is kind of all around us. And the modern mind doesn't really see this. It sees it as unconscious, impersonal, random. So all beauty and reason is understood to be projected by the mind onto the world. And so we're detached from our psyche. We're disconnected to the mystery of life. So the language of astrology allows for us to access the collect it allows us to access the collective world soul, what the ancients called the anima mundi, and they and we were, we were able to participate in it. Um, astrology is a universal language, so it's part of the quantum field. So when we access it, we connect to our higher self, and this both grounds us and elevates us simultaneously, actually. And it has really deep psychological effects. But we have the choice. So our freedom allows us to choose which resonance we utilize, which frequency we vibrate at. And remember, we're not dealing with forces that coerce us, but with psychological, spiritual, and metaphysical energies that lie both with, within ourselves and within the universe. So the horoscope, which is from the Greek horoskopos, horror means time or hour, and skopos, which means observer, is to sort of witness the hour. Um, so these symbols denote the, the planets, um, the 12 zodiac signs, the angular relations um, between the planets and the signs that they're in. And what I really would want to sort of focus on today, we're going to, I think, look just at the planets today. And in, in, in subsequent lectures, we're going to go into more detail on if you like the zodiac and the angles and other things, and maybe look at uh, look at um, what's happening collectively uh, through the transits of 2022. I mean, we are in a huge time of change. I mean, I, I'm, I don't say that lightly. Um, I, I think between now and 2024 is it's is arguably the most important time for humanity since the Great Flood, actually. But that's a big statement. I'm happy to back it up in the subsequent lectures. Now, in traditional ancient astrology, we talk about the seven planets, okay? So I've, I've studied uh, ancient astrology, which is Hellenistic 
astrology. Um, and we tend to focus mainly on the seven planets because those are the only ones visible to the naked eye. So the two luminaries, which is the sun and the moon, and then Mercury through Saturn. The other three, which are Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, they were all discovered in the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries, respectively. So they're very important. But in ancient astrology, one doesn't use them because we didn't know that they, they didn't know that they, they existed. So when seen from the Earth, the planets, they all travel in a fairly, fairly narrow specific section of the sky. This is known as the zodiac. So the progression of all the planets occur on this plane. Um, but we know it as the elliptic. So the term zodiac and elliptic are often used interchangeably. I would say, though, to be specific, the elliptic is the line where the zodiac is the area around the line. And the zodiac is all those lovely shapes that we often anthropomorphize, turn them into animals like Aries, the ram, Taurus, the bull, etc. So now let's turn to the planets themselves. You have two luminaries, the sun and the moon. The sun is the individual conscious sense of self. It's the ego. It's the universal energy um, of which all the planets are but a reflection. The moon, though, symbolizes on the one hand, a very personal and intimate part of the individual's life, but also relates to something energetically much deeper than the level of ego consciousness. And then you have the inner planets, which are Mercury, Venus and Mars, and they're known in astrology as the personal planets. And then you have the outer planets, which are Jupiter, Saturn and Uranus, Neptune and Pluto. And they are, um, I would say, the, 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 Jupiter and Saturn are what we call the social planets. And then the transcendental planets would be Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. At this lecture, I'd like to sort of explain um, some of the planets in relation, in, relational, uh, in a relational way. So let's talk about planets as pairs. So the sun and the earth and their relationship, they're dual centers of the solar system. So the solar system has an objective center, which is the sun, and a subjective center, which is the earth. So the sun is a dynamic center, which would be the masculine or the yang energy, providing almost all the radiant energy for the planet. And obviously it's gravitational field. The earth is feminine, it's yin, and it provides the space for human consciousness to be experienced. So all the energy that is put out by the sun and reflected in different ways by the planets is experienced here on earth. So the earth is our center of awareness. The earth provides matter that is animated by the sun's energy. And then you've got, I'm going to put the pairs of Mercury and the Moon, because they're the two modulators. So in physical terms, the body closest to the Sun is Mercury, and the body closest to the Earth is the Moon. In symbolic terms, Mercury modulates the energies of the Sun, while the Moon does the same for the Earth. Now, modulation turns energy into information, much like a radio turns electrical energy into musical speech. So Mercury is the planet that rules information, communication and speech. You've got to think of Hermes here, who is the Greek equivalent of Mercury. The moon too modulates, but it, it does it in a different way. It reflects the light of the sun, shining it on us here on Earth. It allows us to feel, to intuit. In astrology, the moon has taken on much of the Earth's symbolism. Its position as the primary yin force amongst the celestial bodies and its connection to the mother and all things nurturing. So the moon modulates the symbolic energies of the earth in that it takes energies that are, are a part of us and puts them outside of us so we can perceive them consciously. Mercury modulates the sun's energy and the moon modulates the earth's experiencing of that energy. And then the next pair would be Venus and Mars. So we're still thinking in, in pairs. This is you and me, okay? So it denotes the relationship between the experience of Mars and the experienced Venus. A balance between Mars and Venus is really critical for achieving harmony between subject and object. So if either planet ends up dominating, then the relationship falters. So if Mars dominates, then the entity tries to destroy the realm of the object. But if Venus gets the upper hand, then the entity loses its ability to survive as a separate experiencing entity and is consumed literally from within. The next pair would be Jupiter and Saturn. They're often called the social planets. So where Jupiter is the archetype of support, Saturn goes in the opposite direction and resists. So one thing also to consider is that Venus may integrate you into personal relationships, but Jupiter integrates you into the world. Now in astrology, we talk about Jupiter as the great benefic, 
and it enlarges anything that it touches. Remember, it's king of the gods. You've got to think of Zeus in the Greek myths. The individual is able to manifest and become a member of something much bigger, creatively taking part in a larger social order. So it's connected to the notion of expansion. With Saturn, by contrast, the energy is different and we learn of our obligations. Where Jupiter, Jupiter says yes, Saturn will say no. Saturn tests us, he places demands on us. Unlike Jupiter, where we're supported in our efforts to grow, Saturn places upon us restrictions and we experience a resistance that we must overcome in order to manifest. Now Saturn's the furthest planet that we can see with the naked eye. It thus represents the limits of reality and that it, and it can only be uh, perceived by ordinary consciousness. It's interesting in Greek, uh, Saturn is known as Kronos, the father of time. Um, the following planets, which we often call the transcendental planets, are Uranus, Neptune and Pluto. And they really require an expanded consciousness to be utilized productively. And they break the rules that Saturn dictates. Uranus brings sudden change and disruption and Neptune confuses us, maybe inspires us as well. And what we perceive as truth or falsity, it's, it's, it's tricky. It's interesting that Neptune's playing a big part in Pisces at the moment. It's very hard for us human beings to know, for most of us anyway, what is truth and what is false at the moment. Now, Pluto brings about deep transformation through disintegration and renewal. It's also interesting, and I'll discuss this more in future lectures, but I am very interested in what's called mundane astrology, which is global astrology. And next year is a big year for us here in the United States. The United States next year is experiencing its Pluto return. In 1776, Pluto was 27 degrees Capricorn. Next year, Pluto is 70, 27 degrees Capricorn. Uh, one could argue that in many different ways. Uh, a second American revolution, uh, big shifts, big change. Um, but we'll get to that in another lecture. But Uranus releases us from the strictures of materiality and opens up a door to freedom. Um, only, of course, if we're going to listen to it. Neptune, though, is the vast ocean of the unconscious. It works as a channel for other realities and serves as an imaginative vehicle for spiritual creativity. So Pr Pluto brings about the breakdown that precedes rebirth. Um, I'm going to look at the planets now in more depth, just to give you a little bit more uh, material, and um, then we'll leave. And then I'll I'll go back to chatting with with, with Ezra. So the Sun represents the energy that enables everything else to exist. The Sun obviously signifies light, but it also signifies consciousness, manifestation. It's the ultimate planetary symbol of Yang energy. Literally, it does. It's the polar opposite to the moon, which is yin, because it receives. So these two luminaries are the ultimate manifestation of the primary duality, masculine, feminine, action, reaction. You know, action, uh, active, passive, if you want to use that word. I don't particularly like that. I like the word of, I like the idea of active and receptive. The sun is the archetype of will, it's power, desire, but it's not necessarily sexual power. That's where we get to Mars later. It seeks to constantly express itself authentically. The sun is the ego. It's the entity's will to exist. So in a way, the sun is the archetype of the hero. Think of the hero's journey, setting out upon the world in an attempt to bring order to his or her own world to find meaning. Um, we all have a sun in a particular zodiac sign, but some suns are better aspected than others. So people with strong solar energy tend to be very visible, having strong personalities. Think of the, you know, the sun rules kingship, of course, and people in authority. I think of France's uh, sun king, literally Louis XIV. That's a very obvious example. And like the sun, they provide light and energy so that other people can live and act. They want to be seen. So remember though, that planets do not symbolize actual persons. The relationship exists in a way that the person manifests the energy of the sun. Also, you could say not all kings and presidents will act in a solar manner. I mean, I, I can think of Richard Nixon, for example, who was very Saturnian, and I don't think he had any fire energy in his chart. So, you know, one can become leader without solar energy. 
I, I want you to be clear on that. It's just solar energy does tend to be very visible in a personality trait. Uh, solar people tend not to be particularly modest and they can be very wrapped up in themselves. So a high expression of solar energy would be deep passion to be in service and a leader to the public. A low vibration would be the dictator. Let's jump to the moon. The moon is the planetary archetype of yin. So in a sense, the yin principle defines the circumstances and conditions under which the yang energy can manifest. So the moon's yin nature gives place and form to the action of the sun's yang. It is the root and foundation of that which can experience existence. The moon archetype is that of the medium or container in which an energy may develop. Remember the lunar principle is reflective light. Okay, it's not active, actual light, it's reflective light. It's the archetype of the container is a nurturing matrix. Okay, so think of seeds, eggs, wombs, the earth soil. It's all realms of the moon, all forms of motherhood, whether it be literal or metaphysical or ruled by the moon. And so it's related to the concept of the great mother. And it's our past, our childhood, heredity and family. It's also bound up with our own country and native land. Notice how the homeland is often seen as feminine. So where the sun is often seen as the conscious self, the moon is the unconscious self. The moon in many respects is, um, is our unconscious uh, is our unconscious sense of self. And it, it also can rule things like our childhood, uh, our early childhood, um, and uh, stuff we've learned from our parents. The moon is associated with feelings and emotions. This is very important. It's also associated with psychic ability as the moon represents a mode of perception in which everything is connected. Now the moon doesn't naturally separate where the sun does. So one thing I'd like to ponder on is the lack of balance in our society between solar and lunar energy. I think this is what's interesting why an organization actually like the Alchemist Kitchen actually exists, is to probably redress that imbalance. And anyone who's meaningfully and genuine in a spiritual contemplative um, you know, state, they are really, whether it's in themselves or collectively want to redress that balance. And that deficit of yin, yin energy um, it has, to be, it has to be restored. And I'm not talking about man, woman here, I'm talking about the energetics themselves. It's not just about women getting ahead in the political sense or social sense, it's, it's really about understanding the yin principle is not nourished. And when it's not nourished and given equal measure with the yang, then we're out of balance. Um, the yin principle is in all of us, including men. In our current paradigm, we're taught to go out into the world and to be like a, ma like a man, we're taught to dominate, we're taught to succeed through mastery. This is very yang. We're not taught to intuit. We're not taught to pause, reflect, wait, ponder. Um, you know, it's, it's been dog eats dog for quite a while. It's changing, of course. This whole paradigm is, is collapsing. And we, we've got to co-create together. But it's very important to find balance between the yin and the yang, uh, the, between the solar and the lunar principle. We don't want to go from suddenly having too much gold in the world to too much silver, because I actually think gold and silver is symbolic of, of the imbalance. You know, gold is way too valuable. Silver is too undervalued. Um, that's another story. I can talk about that uh, separately. Um, let's jump now to Mercury. So where the sun is at one end of the polarity of yang energy, the moon on the other, you've got Mercury, which is a little androgynous um, in the middle. And Mercury kind of represents the link between spirit and form. He signifies the power to overcome the gap that exists between separate entities. So within the 3D, human consciousness exists in a world of division, subject, object, you know, all that. And um, Mercury, He's the only god or archetype that can go from the height of Olympus to the depth of Hades. He's, he can be in multiple worlds, often simultaneously. So he rules travel as well as commerce. Mercury represents the power of symbol making, as all of our knowing, experiencing, sensing, believing, or disbelieving is done through signs, which represent actual facts and experiences. So for example, our impression of the ocean standing on a sandy beach is not the thing itself. It is actually the brain's experience of the impact of a pattern of light waves focused on the retina of the eye. So what we see as the ocean is only our experience of an aspect of the total reality of the ocean. 
So the element attributed to Mercury varies according to its sign and any planets aspecting it, but it is most associated with the air signs because air is communication. But we're gonna to get to the elements in future classes. So Mercury is the bridge. Mercury is the mediator and he's the messenger. And he's usually associated with conscious thought as he tends to analyze, interpret and explain. But Mercury can also be elusive. Uh, he can be here one moment, he's gone the next. He can be a little bit of a trickster, um, flashing in and out of reality. I mean, he kind of likes to play the devil's advocate. He can be pretty contrary at times. He's also the juggler in the traditional playing deck, but he's the magician in the tarot. He likes to do more than one thing and live in multiple realities. That's why he's associated with Gemini. We'll talk more about the zodiac signs next time. So here are some key words that describe the mercurial archetype. Um, reason, which can lead to brilliance or skepticism and cynicism. So there's a duality, discrimination or indecisiveness. Expressiveness, which can lead to either articulation or verbosity. So these are the high, low vibrations. You see, you have a choice. The next planet would be Venus. Now, in the universe, there are two different forces that bring things together. One is coercive, which seeks to unite elements regardless of their individual natures or inclinations. And so such a force is working from the outside and it doesn't express the natures of the elements themselves. It creates a conflict uh, with the intrinsic natures of the elements involved, working with the energy of coercion from without. So the external force must be maintained or the elements forced together will break apart and try to resume their individuality and free expression. So depending on the conditions, such coercive forces may be represented by various combinations of Mars, Saturn and Pluto. But Venus, it's very different. This is the second force. OK, it's intrinsic and it's voluntarily. The entities come together because their differences are complementary. This is important because they can create a new whole that is of a higher vibration. It's more um, complete. It's more stable compared to that of the state of separation in which they have previously existed. So this coming together, this union is the Venusian way. That means it pertains to Venus. Uh, Venus is all about merging. It signifies love. So in the language of science and physics, this is the essence of subatomic particles bonding into atoms and then atoms forming into molecules and then molecules complexes becoming cells and organisms, etc. But for us human beings, this is love. Uh, of all the forces that bind people together, love produces the most stable groupings. And I'm not just talking about romantic love, you know, the Greeks will talk about eros, yes, but philia, agape, many different types of love. So unless you've established yourself as an individual, Venus can't operate properly in your life. You have to express who you truly are and be authentic before you can love or be truly loved in return. So if love is an attraction that comes about through self-expression, there must first be an individuality to express. Those that give up their individuality in what they think is a love relationship often wonder why their partner loses interest in them. It's hard to love someone whose individuality has been submerged, even if it has been submerged into oneself. So from a temperature perspective, Venus is cool and moist, feminine, it's nocturnal, it rules beauty, it rules the aesthetics, art. Um, it's love, goodwill, attraction, a force that harmonizes and brings us together. Venus is obviously yin energy and it seeks to receive and merge, okay? Mars is totally different. It's pure survival. It's the third chakra. It's primal, therefore represents the gut instinct from which its will to power and focus drive. So nothing exists in nature without the energy of Mars enabling it to survive. It rules anger, self-assertion, courage. And in astrology, we say it governs things like soldiers, war, fevers, rashes, wounds, even volcanic eruptions. Mars is very individualistic. And this is why it is so associated with the zodiac sign of Aries. Mars tends to focus on differences rather than similarities, as it seeks to survive by eliminating others who might be seen as competition. So excess aggression is nothing more than an overabundance of survival energy, which seeks to control its environment. So when one's Mars energies are challenged, one reacts with the fight or flight syndrome, 
adrenaline is released and the body begins to react to a stressful situation in which it must either defend itself or run away. What's interesting is that in ancient mythology, Mars or Ares, as he's known in Greek, was actually accompanied by um, uh, Phoebus and Deimos, and they're both fear and panic. And these are the names of the two moons of the planet of Mars. So Mars and his attendants tend to be unconscious and act rashly. Now, let me be clear what I've said so far. This is a description of Mars operating in the third dimensional reality and at a lower frequency, okay? Where the material plane is polarized and it's separate, it's brutal, it's unconscious. But at a higher level of consciousness, Mars will operate somewhat, somewhat differently. He will be more competitive within himself, okay, or herself having little desire to compare oneself to others. So at a higher frequency, Mars will seek to improve upon one's performance in order to become better, stronger. And maybe Mars will, will be fighting to defend the weak, defend an idea, to, to defend civilization, to defend a group. Um, in a way, it's the divine sacred masculine, the warrior to protect the weak from harm. So now we've discussed both Mars and Venus. Um, I'm going to jump now to Jupiter, um, where Jupiter relates to two very different but connected energies, the energy of expansion and the energy of integration. So let's deal with the energy of expansion. Um, Jupiter expands something from within the psyche. Um, as we grow, grow older from early childhood, we learn that our world is separate and Jupiter helps us to recreate and expand our awareness of the external in order to integrate it back into our psyches. So Jupiter relates to conscious expansion, learning the love of philosophy, things like the higher mind. Um, it's often a, uh, associated with sort of a desire for travel, international travel, the desire for freedom and independence. In astrology, he's known as the great benefic. In other words, whatever Jupiter touches, um, it is blessed, it's magnified. Um, wherever Jupiter is in your chart, unless you have a very poorly aspected Jupiter, you are going to have some form of abundance. And everyone has Jupiter somewhere, like everyone has Saturn somewhere. So Jupiter does have a slightly similar energy to the sun, but it rules things like religion, spirituality, even law to an extent, even though Saturn, that's Saturn's domain as well. Um, priests, philosophers, astrologers, uh, these are qualities which are from the Jupiterian. Um, when in balance, Jupiter is abundant growth because it's the principle of expansion. But when it's out of balance, is issues of excess can arise, uh, which include things like wastefulness and laziness. So the key words for the archetype of Jupiter would be understanding, prosperity, abundance, faith and optimism. Um, uh, if I give you an example quickly of focusing on the higher, lower levels of expression of Jupiter, generosity at the high, high level of expression would go to philanthropy, but at the lower, it would go to extravagance. Religion at the high would be something like devoutness, and lower would be sort of fanaticism. Orthodoxy, too, at the high expression of orthodoxy, would be reverence, but at the low, it would be something like bigotry. So you have to just see how you're going to operate through your free will, how you're going to use your Jupiterian energy. Um, Saturn, very different. Saturn is the oldest of the gods and goddesses, and it's the oldest and also the, the last planet that's visible to the naked eye. Saturn represents the first law of manifestation, uh, the law of limitation. Saturn can, can, uh, concentrates his energy uh, and he's known as the father of time um, and he deals with structures, limitations, material reality, um, aging, maturity, death and dying. I always say uh, Saturn always says no, uh, where Jupiter always says yes. Um, Saturn is often associated with hardship, duty. People who have strong Saturns in their chart, they're very serious, they take their job very seriously. Um, they often can look a little older uh, from their years. Um, uh, there can be sometimes a sense of rigidity or repression or, or oppression, um, but also on a high level, it's deeply reliable, uh, very, very um, practical. It's an earth-based sign. sign. Um, but when you see it collectively, as we're seeing it today, 
and I'll talk more about this in the next lectures, it gets more exciting. Uh, Saturn is kind of out of control in the sense of too much in control. Saturn is really trying at the moment, and you see it astrologically, Saturn and Capricorn for the last two and a half years, now Saturn and Aquarius, it's ruling signs, uh, dominating. And uh, Saturn wants to basically, Saturn would like to have like a global, uh, one world global system, uh, wants total control. It doesn't want uh, freedom. Don't forget, who, what does Saturn do in myth? He castrates his father. Isn't that interesting? Saturn castrates his father Uranus. So when you start to see how the myths play out, you can start to apply them to how we as human beings and our structures play out. And it's not personal. It's mythological. Um, of course, the lockdown here is quite a Saturnian concept to lock down. That's Saturn saying, right, you know, you are restricted. Jupiter doesn't do that. Saturn does that. But a high functioning Saturn places limits on powers, okay, and creates regulations. So let me be clear, Saturn, when expressed at the high vibration, is very efficacious. Its rules and regulations but it's not corrupted. It's in service of humanity. It takes its power very seriously and protects. Where Saturn at a low interpretation, at a low frequency, is tyranny. Wow. Now, so, so when, yeah, go on. Uh, I was gonna right? say it's 747 and okay. oh my God, it's like a ton of questions. Like for me, I'm like, oh my God, I have so many questions to ask, but I'd like to open this up to our sure. audience because um, this is a free intro to a course that George will be teaching next month in January, which will culminate in a sound bath at the Elixir Bar. So before, you know, we... Um, and this at eight o'clock, I'd like to open it up for everybody. Uh, you could unmute yourself and we could just have a conversation with George um, regarding, you know, the course, the uh, archetypes, which by the way, that was amazing because it helps um, explain to me, and I'm not into astrology, explains to me all of this energy between the planets and how they interact. So please just unmute yourself and one at a time, please ask your questions to George. Hello, please speak up. I'm, I love, this is my favorite part of, 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 of a lecture is the interreaction. Can you hear all of us? I can. Hello, Jill. Uh, hello there. Um, I was given the wrong ID number, so I've only been able to be connected for two minutes. I've been emailing. So my question is, other than hello and greetings, and I'm a triple Capricorn. <laughs> so um, will this uh, be able to be recorded and maybe sent to me? Because I'd like to follow up with you. You're right on target. I, I would be delighted, Jill. I mean, for me, this is, gives me such pleasure to connect with wonderful souls like yourself. And, do you know, this is very interesting, Jill. You're a triple Capricorn. I need so much of that. I haven't got any Earth in my chart whatsoever. Well, you know, maybe we can have a transfusion. <laughs> <laughs> but have you I'm got a no positive. Oh, oh, unfortunately, I'm rhesus negative. I'm an ET soul. You never know. There's always the moon. <laughs> there you go. Very so good. thank you very much. I hope to get a recording. I treasure this. Thank you. Yes, there will be a recording and it will be thank you. sent to everyone that signed up. So Leo Kadia is asking, I'm curious about both sides of each planet. Will, will we be able to enhance the higher or more positive side of our sign or planets? That's a great question. So in this realm, I believe in the galaxy, we have free will, we come here to choose, but there are archetypal destinies. So I would argue when I read people's soul contracts, I'm trying to illuminate the soul contract that is yours. So let's just take Jill, she's just told me she's a triple Capricorn. 
it depends on where the placements are, but there's definitely going to be a preponderance of needing to ground and to be earthed in this life. And that's her comfort area. And the question is, is how does she, how does she do that at a high expression or at a low? So the high expression would be using material um, abundance in order to grow, to prosper, to share, to teach. At a low vibration, it would be to hoard. To, 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 to keep it just for me. So we have these choices, all of us, how we choose to express our sun, our moon, our mercury. I mean, this is powerful, powerful food for the soul because it allows us to really start to know who we are. And when we start to know who we are, that's when you can start to love someone else. And I don't mean just in the love of, of, of Eros. I mean the love of Agape, the love of God, the love of Philia, the brother, the sister, the partner. It doesn't matter who it is. The relational aspect is greatly enhanced when you understand yourself better through the chart. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is, how do you think we can use your workshop in our lives? Um, in many ways, I would hope. Um, I mean, certainly astrology has become a lot more popular. I, I, I don't want to say it's mainstream yet, but it's getting there. The thing is, is it, 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 a lot of people still just sticking to sun sign astrology, or maybe you know your moon and maybe your ascendant. That's great. But once you start to understand how your Mercury is, how you communicate, how you share information, how does that relate to your sun, your, your, your ego and your conscious sense of self? How does that relate to Saturn, to how you ground? Mm -hmm. uh, these are powerful tools, as I just said previously. So that's a, a useful uh, textbook from which you can use knowledge in order to go out there and either have a, a be better at your job or have a better relationship with your mother or father or with your partner or to know yourself better i mean i, I don't see I, I the sky is the limit once you tap into this cosmic language mm -hmm. thank you thank you for the questions anybody else that is curious that would like to know more um, about George and, and or the course itself, um, highly recommend. I could actually, if I can jump in there, I think Jill's about to ask, I, I get the sense. So next <laughs> next lecture, which is going to be in, in they're all in January on, on Sunday. The next lecture is on the 12 zodiac signs. I'm going to discuss their meaning and how each sign has a unique connection with the planets. And um, we'll also look at sort of, uh, the seasons, the elements, the modality, and they all play a part too, and they define the characteristics of the sign. Then the following lecture is going to be on the angles, and that's to do with, uh, this very important. You see, everything is math, mathematics, it's the music of the spheres. If you have your sun making a specific angle, let's say it's a square to Saturn, that's going to be quite challenging. Now, of course, a challenge eventually, if you're working hard as a soul, you're going to turn it into a support. And often very successful people have a lot of squares in their chart. And people who have trines, which is a beautiful flow of energy, sometimes they can end up being quite lazy. So, you know, it's very complex. It's very multivalent. But we will discuss that in the lectures. And hopefully by the end, uh, obviously, in the last lecture, we'll be applying it to the global uh, situation, the global zeitgeist and looking at transits. And that's for me where I get super excited is trying to give you some insights into how to navigate uh, this remarkable time in our lives, which is actually very exciting, but it is also scary because it's unknown. And one of the things that um, before the recording started that George and I were, were talking is that we are at the Alchemist Kitchen, one of our goals is really to bring community together. So even if we are, you know, hunkering down, staying at home, that we have the opportunity to connect and to learn from each other. So one of my questions, um, George, is how do we prepare for your course? Is, is, are there books on, on archetype or should we have our birth chart? Like what, what would be, um, other than having an open heart and open mind, you know, what, what can we do to um, I, prepare I, for it? I, I'm one of these people at this stage. I mean, I'm imagining most people coming here are either beginners or intermediates, or they're just wanting another perspective. And if there are any advanced, that's terrific. For me, I kind of don't want to give you books at this stage. 
I would like to see everyone's birth chart and make it, depending on how many people we have in the class, um, mm -hmm. you could even set up a WhatsApp group or however you do it, where mm -hmm. I can, I'm very happy to spend some time in between each lecture sharing ideas on the birth chart. I kind of like that. Um, uh, but I, I kind of want people to delve in with what I've come up with and then, then interact with it. I want it to be more interactive. I don't want it to be too intellectual with other books. It's going to be intellectual enough because I'm disseminating quite a lot of information. Yeah. But then, of course, you can listen to it a second time and take it because I know I speak fast and there's a lot of information, but I know we, I've done this enough. If you re-listen to it, it will go in. I often listen to lectures two or three times. Awesome. Yeah, I, that, that's my thought. I'm like, ooh, I'm taking notes on my phone and I'm like, yeah, that's something Don't to do revisit. That. <laughs> I mean, just listen to it a absorb. second time. Okay. Yeah. Absorb, absorb. Okay. I mean, the other thing is, so I know as I was going on and on and on, I didn't get to Uranus or Neptune or Pluto today, which is fine. Uh, but those outer planets, you know, are important. And I, I may uh, factor them in a little bit in the next lecture then. Uh, or unless you want me to give a little bit of talk about them now. Well, you yeah. have four minutes. Okay. Yeah, so very, that would be great. Very quickly, as I, as we're recording this, what's um, important is the, the transcendental planet. So you've got Uranus, which was discovered in, I think, 1781. And it's the first planet beyond Saturn to be discovered since antiquity. Now, in Greek mythology, Uranus is a sky god. So he's the father of Saturn. I've already told you this, that he gets castrated by his son. So what does that mean? Uranus rules the heavens, but he, 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 he really is the unexpected event. He really is the cosmic trickster. Anyone with a strong Uranian signature is going to be full of surprises, revelations. I mean, you can't make this stuff up, but the orange man, Mr. Trump, has Uranus conjunct the sun, okay? So when you start using astrology, you know, forget what we all personally think and our own stories are we like, we dislike, all that nonsense. When you see the astrology, you go, wow, wow. You know, that the Uranian energy with that man is powerful. End of story, you know. And so what does the Uranian principle mean? It's inventiveness. It's erraticness. It's it's a pioneer. It can be fanatic, but it's rebellion. It's freedom. It's liberation. It's reform. It's revolution. And it's unexpected breakups of structure. And then, of course, we're going to jump to Neptune. It's totally different. Neptune's vibration is not of the earthly plane. And I'm going to slow down now as I describe it, because, of course, <laughs> to jump to the Neptunian energy is 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 boundless it's cosmic and it, it's elusive it's mysterious it's unfathomable and it's a pervading energy that flows like an ocean from the subconscious into the conscious and it can't be quantified neptune can reach the most sublime heights or the lowest depths it can be alcoholism and suicide and sabotage self-sabotage or it can be utter mystical knowledge and union with the cosmos I mean, it's fascinating. I've got a Mercury, uh, Mercury in Pisces. This is Neptune in modern astrology rules Pisces. Neptune is currently in Pisces. Uh, Pisces is is it, we're going to get to that. Is the great mystic and mystical. Now, the last one because I've running out of time is Pluto, and the planetary archetype is is really epic. Whatever Pluto touches. It empowers and it intensifies. It's never the same again. It's associated with the principle of elemental power, depth, intensity. It's deeply instinctual. It's libidinal as well. It's aggressive. It's destructive. It's regenerative. It's volcanic. It's cathartic. It totally transforms you. Uh, it's the cycle of death and rebirth. It's the biological processes of birth, sex, and death. Pluto represents the underworld. You've got to think of Hades here. It's subterranean, it's geological, it's political, it's social, it's sexual. It's, it's often associated with the Dionysian, uh, Persephone, Pan, Medusa, Isis, Osiris, Shiva, Kali. It, go, it goes on. And we're dealing with titanic powers here, intensity, violations, destructions. So Pluto is transformation. So what does that mean? Pluto is in Capricorn at the moment, 26 degrees. Next year is the, is the second Pluto return of the United States. Total, total change of the United States. It's a rebirth. I think we're going to have a second, second American revolution. We'll have a, a renewal of the Constitution, I hope. Mm -hmm. You see, so these are much deeper, more transcendental planets and we can get more into them. But I just wanted to give you that little bit of that. So at least it's recorded. So when we go into the 12 zodiac signs, we've done the planets. OK. Amazing. Amazing. And yes, I will re 
we listen to all of this and absorb before we actually start the, the, the course itself. Um, last chance, everyone, before we close. I was just going to say thank you. And also, this is very poignant in particular to the new moon on January 2nd, it being with the moon conjunct the sun in Capricorn. So yeah. thank you. No, that's a big one for you as a triple cap. That's very exciting. Exactly, exactly to the degree. Wow. Well, I look forward wow. to hearing how that plays out for you. Actually, you could be quite a good exemplar in class of how that's playing okay. out. Okay, and I'm up for that. Thank you. And, and as, and as I always like to end, as Carl Jung once said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. <laughs> Bravo. That's, that's, that's a t-shirt quote right there. So <laughs> thanks everyone. And if you, you would like to sign up for the course, it is up on the Alchemist Kitchen events calendar. Mm -hmm. So George, thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone for coming and joining the course, uh, this class. So I'll wait for everyone to sign off. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this family and hopefully we can grow this into a nice group of people and, and we can all benefit from the communal um, yeah. uh, energy. Yes. Awesome guys. Thank you. Okay. See you, see you and enjoy your night. <laughs>